All right, good day, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation, the Workforce Management Blueprint for Electrical Contractors, sponsored by Rivet Work. My name is Colleen Beatty, and I'm the senior editor here at Electrical Contractor Magazine. On behalf of the magazine, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's presentation. So before we get started, I'm just gonna go over some quick housekeeping items. Uh, please note that today's presentation is being recorded and we'll be providing you with a link to that recording after the webinar is over. So just keep an eye out on your email for that, um, for that link. Um, so, you know, if you miss anything or you have to leave early, that's totally okay. You can come back anytime and watch the recording when it works for you. And of course, we encourage your participation in today's webinar, so please send us your questions. You can submit them at any time during the presentation using the Q&A module on the bottom right of your screen. I'm going to highlight that for you now. And we'll have time at the end of the webinar to answer those questions. You can also use the Q&A window to reach out if you have any technical difficulties. There's also a quick survey that should pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar, and we hope you're gonna fill that out. Or if you want to fill it out early, you totally can. Just click the icon with the clipboard at the bottom of your screen to open it up. Now with all that out of the way, I'd like to welcome today's speakers, Brian Witt and Gary Fox from River, Rivet Work. Brian and Gary share decades of experience in truly tackling workforce management problems with thousands of electrical contracting businesses, as well as experiences, challenges, and successes from contractors across the globe. They joined the team at Rivet Work on a shared mission to help establish and evolve the construction workforce management category with contractors and for contractors. They also host the workforce management podcast, Construction is Hard. Welcome, Brian and Gary. Thanks, Colleen. We really appreciate uh, kind of the opportunity to share what's, uh, what we've been seeing. And I think the, um, the big thing that I want to throw out there as we start today's discussion, everybody, is um, Gary and I have had the opportunity to uh, speak with a lot of contractors, um, some of the people that might be in the room here today over the years, and uh, we've gotten the chance to um, live some of this, uh, talk to hundreds of contractors at this point about this specific part of the business and uh, pick up on some trends. And so today I think is going to be very conversational. I'm coming to you all from Kansas City, uh, Rivet's office here in Kansas City. Uh, Gary's with us uh, from up in Evansville, Evansville Wisconsin. And uh, with that all being said, I think it's also pertinent to uh, point out. So Gary, um, we crossed paths, what now, seven years ago, something like that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I was about to say a little bit more kind of Gary's lived this. Uh, I want to kind of throw that out there and give him a chance to, to kind of walk through his experience with workforce management. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I, I have lived this. Uh, I was an electrical contractor for 40 plus years. 20 of those years I spent as the vice president of construction for Westfall and Company as an electrical contractor in, in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> I've been into the workforce management ideas for several years and have tried to develop processes and systems before platforms were available and, and worked diligently to try to improve our processes throughout my career. I joked that I, I tried to, I worked hard to try to figure out how I didn't have to do anything by delegating and, and uh, disseminating responsibilities across the company. Uh, I never made, quite made it to that, but upon my retirement, I went to work with uh, with Labor Chart uh, as a consultant, uh, helped them with the development of their platform, worked then with Procor when, after the acquisition of Labor Chart and now doing pretty much the same thing with with Rivet. Um, and we're trying to build a, the best platform we can that uh, ties into the workforce management ideas that we're gonna present today. And I think uh, as far as today goes, our, our intent, like why Gary and I, uh, I think we're afforded the opportunity to speak with you all today is really centered around, uh, we've just, we've had an opportunity now to watch this 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 idea and this workforce management concept be successful uh, on on countless occasions now, and, and that's key. Um, there is a real a real gap and a real struggle in the industry in this specific area, and it's not just about uh, what platform you may or may not be using. It's not just about what processes you may or may not have. 
it all kind of comes together. And so I think a lot of what Gary and I are hoping to share today is just simply um, we've had an opportunity to be inside the four walls and we just want to share um, what we've started to identify as the common trends, uh, the core uh, pieces, the, the the base or trace elements that, that really tie a lot of this stuff together. And so with that, I think there's, we're, we're going to start today off with a little bit of sort of what we're talking about or trying to visualize the area of the business that we're referencing. When we say workforce management and specifically the labor operations piece or this concept of continuously aligning my people across my projects over time. And that continuous piece is key and, and, and that over time piece is key. Um, so, I mean, right here, this is a very, very simple example, but I think it will help illustrate what we're trying to attack or what we're trying to uh, piece together today. And this concept here, you got like five projects, right? We've got three maybe that are happening right now. And I have a couple that are coming down the pipe, maybe they're pursuits or they just haven't started yet. Uh, and that's project four and five are kind of coming up in the distance. And I've got my uh, my, supervi my supervision or my field leaders. I've got my field team. Uh, I might have some key assets even. But the whole concept is I've got them arrayed across these projects. And then I'm starting to identify in the future where we may need some of these, uh, these resources or personnel kind of down the road. And I, I think this, this alone can actually be quite a feat. Uh, to start just even breaking it out to this level of where, what are the current whereabouts and, and how do we keep seeing that even potentially uh, in real time? Uh, well, in this illustration, you know, we're showing five projects. And just that alone, you can see, you start to see some of the complexity of what's happening here with your field leadership, equipment, field team. And that's not, you know, we have nothing to do with safety uh materials just trying to illustrate here the complexity of these projects as they stand alone and we're showing five or three current projects two future projects but in reality you know this could be 50 to 100 to 100 plus right and and so when you start looking at it in, in this nature and start being able to segment this out say across 50 projects, you know, imagine what that screen would look like over 50 projects and, and how many people uh, feel leadership and equipment involved in, in this simplistic slide. And then apply, apply what's really happening today, which is I have to, as we mentioned, I have to maneuver these assets across jobs. As you can see, I have to maneuver. Every last one is going to eventually lead somewhere, go somewhere. I've got to get them to the next place. And, and this is this is uh, this is the organized uh, uh, chaos that I think we're trying to illustrate. This is organized chaos. This is reality, though, as well. Every one of those those lines is an action that actually does take place. So Phone again, email. visualize the screen. Yeah, visualize a screen of fifty projects and what this would look like. Um, and that is really what's going on in your organization. Um, this is the organized chaos. And this is what the epitome of what we're going to try to break down today and what our book, this is all about, there's a workforce management pamphlet or book that, that Gary and I, in combination with some of our team at Rivet, tried to help consolidate and put into writing. And so today we're just trying to convey why it's worth the 15 minutes to read the book, right? But we're going to highlight and go in deeper into a couple topics. But the first one is like visualize this problem. And if we get a common understanding of the problem, you know, Gary and I are not just here to agitate this all day, but we also want to uh, help people that this might be the first time they're hearing workforce management, right? Or they, they might be hearing about this kind of labor operations piece. And we're trying to help visualize and get a common understanding. So that chaos that we just talked about, you know, on this last slide, you know, Gary and I have a couple favorite sort of um, scenarios or almost uh, uh, signs to be wary of today. These are these can help put a spotlight on some things that are happening uh, in the organization today um, that can help draw your attention and might help also exemplify whether what we're saying is actually uh, uh, accurate and happening in your four walls or not. Um, Gary, you call them you call them gremlins. Yeah, you know you're you're looking here at a spreadsheet help on the right hand side, and then the the thing that always strikes me funny in in this slide is that 
there's one person there. <clears throat> it's because usually one person is the owner of the spreadsheet. Now you could have multiple rooms that look just like this, right? And they, they all, in each individual owns a spreadsheet and there, there's no synergy between, the, between these spreadsheets that have their own owners. And so here's an example of a lot of responsibility falling on one person's shoulders when you have an entire team of, of people that are trying to, to help and assist in, in putting these projects together and run your company. Um, so here's a, a good example of spreadsheet hell. And we talk about, you know, kind of spreadsheet hell is one of our favorite kind of uh, ways of exemplifying or coining, you know, the effects. But um, the chaos we mentioned in the last slide with all those arrows and all the different projects to, to Gary's point, you know, that usually is falling into spreadsheets. We don't have um, other purpose built tools that help us sort of uh, clean it up or visualize it or, or align it. And so, as you can see on the right hand side, we're starting with spreadsheet hell here. So on the right hand side, that image, we usually see, uh, you might have, think about it, we've got owners of different spreadsheets. So we might have a PM or somebody managing their spreadsheet for their project. So that's like one of the screens up there, right? But at some point, it, it all has to come together. Uh, it's all got to consolidate to get the master forecast or the master spreadsheet, right? Maybe that's what happens in our in our labor meetings. I can't tell you how many groups we've talked to where there's a weekly or a biweekly meeting where we've just got to pull all the labor and all the operational stakeholders together to go through this consolidation effort. And, and that one person Gary's talking about, that leads us to the left-hand side of the screen, which is one of my favorite kind of analogy or stories of... Uh, of Sisyphus. And so not to turn this into a, a, a dang history lesson, but Sisyphus is this like Greek mytho mythological character, right? And uh, he's condemned to, to hell and uh, is damned to basically push a boulder up a hill for eternity. And the whole idea is it's this never ends. This task never ends and it never really gets him anywhere. Um, that really is happening in a lot of uh, a lot of organizations today when it comes to labor operations, when it comes to this idea of aligning all of our people across all these projects. And what we mean by that is we're not trying to just agitate the problem here. We're trying to say, look for that individual or that team. Uh, usually there is someone that is the labor coordinator or superintendent of, of a VP of operations even that's ultimately trying to align the people across the projects. But one of the key things that the book points out and that I think Gary and I are trying to convey is if you think of this workforce management, you break it down into its core elements, and then you start to apply different processes and start to address different parts of the organization, this Sisyphus, this poor fellow pushing this boulder up the hill, we can start to get the team behind it, especially if we put a platform in place or some kind of a tool that helps us consolidate this information and consolidate the, people, the people's efforts bring all of our people together, let them see the same thing in real time and start doing standard tasks to contribute to the bigger picture. We start to get more people behind that boulder and we get a team effort to kind of help carry that load. Here's, the, here's a good illustration of individuals, right? Let's, let's look at the fork truck on the, on the left hand uh, slide. Let's pull the head into place and help use that to help push the boulder up the hill. Uh, Let's give the individual on the on the right hand side some help in managing the workforce management. And, and so, if you can identify these people, if you're you have a person that's in spreadsheet hell and you have a person that's pushing the boulder up the hill, and you can identify that, that's an opportunity now to look at your processes, put a team effort in place, because I really believe I'm a big proponent of uh, managing your your projects with a team effort versus a few individuals. You, you, you need to engage everyone to do it in the proper manner. And the platform will give you the opportunity to do that. And when we say that, think about, you know, of course, yes, our project managers or our project stakeholders are aware of labor, but where do they really go to see it? And when do we define when they are supposed to have input, when they are supposed to have a, a coordination do we send people to and from jobs and is everybody is are all the stakeholders in the job truly aware before we send the person that this could impact this job, the budget, et cetera. 
Um, and if it sounds ridiculous, it's because usually the action of trying to alert everybody incurs countless phone calls, and thus we get all the, the orange lines from our last view here, right? This is why we don't go about it. It doesn't seem or feel feasible, but there are ways of breaking it down. And that's, I think that's ultimately, Gary, it's fair to say why we, we wrote this book or why we wanted to put this stuff together is, um, you know, this stuff on the screen, you get it, right? Labor is the greatest risk. We get that. But, but this workforce management ideology and what this book does is it's going to break down here are different key concepts, and then also here are different ways of identifying how are we doing today, right? How do I compare to maybe the, uh, the shop down the road from me, as well as who normally should be involved with these areas, but it's not about the pieces, it's how we, we, we cinch it all together. And we'll talk more about that later, but I think ultimately we wrote the book because we've now seen enough organizations get to a, the next level. I mean, really, the next level of, of labor operations, of forecasting, of, of intentionally moving our people from one job to the next, beating the labor, the, the labor budget, I mean, squeezing profit points out, um, that we want to now share it. And, and again, it's 15 minutes to really, I think, thoroughly go through and read it. And again, today, we're going to hit on some of the high stuff, but we're trying to, I think we're just trying to share some some pieces of why it's so important and why we want everybody to uh, to have a chance to download it and see what's going on. What are groups now across this country starting to achieve to get there? And I think one of the big pieces uh, to start is is, is forecasting. Um, forecasting is, I think it's, I think it's fair to say it's the low hanging fruit. Uh, it's kind of a cheap shot for Gary and I to start off with forecasting because everybody's chasing it. We know that. And and if you're not chasing it, uh, you probably should be, quite frankly, uh, especially in this market. But forecasting is also this very, very elusive or loose term if you think about it. Like try to draw forecasting for an eighth grader. It's it's a hard thing to try to draw out or to define. And when we start, when we talk about getting a team approach to some of these areas of labor operations or workforce management, um, one of the first things that the book does break down for us is is forecasting and how you can actually take this high level organizational approach, but break it down into individual moments, tasks, events or processes that then aggregate together. Uh, so Gary and I approach forecasting with you got to start by labor planning every job. And what does a labor plan mean? How is that feasible? Uh, that's where, again, you need a lot of uh, a lot of processes, and and that leads to some other accountability pieces. Uh, I mean, Gary, you you did this, so you actually, I'll turn it over to you. You've gone through this journey. Yeah, this is a, a great illustration of what's really happening, right? If you see the data date, uh, the red line, the red vertical line, look to the left, and that's all actuals coming back from from accounting. Uh, UERP, and to the to the right of the line is uh, everything that is forecasted out into the future. The combination of a actual labor plan in the dark blue lines, the light blue lines as labor request, uh, people we feel that we're going to need uh, out in the future that aren't currently in our active workforce of 142, which is the dotted line, um, dotted horizontal line. Then in, in the mountain regions are. Uh, you know, jobs that we've won that, that are going to impact our labor needs. And then the, the prospective uh, job forecast, which is uh, things that are hanging fire and w we expect to get some of this work and this is gonna be the impact. It gives you the ability in one place um, to analyze what your, what your current situation is and whether you should be pursuing work or whether or not you should should be backing off because you're not going to be able to man the project and so this is there's, a, there's an awful lot of information here and it's it's critical to understand that this is real time this is happening in real time this thing gets updated on a, on a, a minute by minute basis as people are entering information in so you're always on top of what the situation is and it's a single source of truth in real time and that's a pretty powerful thing. I think one of the big things too is um, everybody's getting, everybody's doing a version of this today, right? We, we, we get that. 
Um, but usually by the time we get it, um, it's, it's actually out of date or we have given so much time and effort in trying to consolidate it and create that master spreadsheet or uh, report up the, the latest monthly forecast or whatever it might be. Or quite frankly, what we really hear a lot behind the closed doors is, yeah, like we're, we're taking a, a swag guess at what's going on. And I get forecasts can only get so accurate. But when you're looking at this here, as Gary mentioned, I am seeing how many people are in my workforce today with that 142. We are able to see where the committed work or the one work is in that hash blue pattern. We're able to see, are we staffing against that? Have we actually allocated the workforce with those bars? Are the bars coming up to meet that blue hash pattern? Or where are the gaps? And then finally, where are the the, the bars, the, the committed or forecast to work, the hash blue mountain range? Where is the perspective work, the hashed orange mountain ranges? Where is that going over our, our 142 dotted dashed line? And Gary has a, a concept too about uh, planning yourself into a labor shortage. As everybody's talking about the labor shortage, we get it, but we're also kind of kicking ourselves a little bit when we and we chase all this work and we win it and then it goes over to labor operations. It's like, well, how the hell are we supposed to accomplish it? So Gary, anything to add on the uh, kind of planning yourself into a labor shortage? Well, yeah, this is, that's exactly right. You can, you can do that. And that that's a pretty dangerous place to be because if, if you're, you're taking on more work than you can actually achieve, you're, you're putting yourself in a pretty precarious position. Uh, I've been there. I, I we've had projects like that that have put us in those positions, and, and it's not fun. Um, it 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 gets to the point where you start driving in a lot of overtime. You're wearing your crews out. Your productivity level just falls right in the tank, and and you can never catch up. And and the whole situation starts to snowball on you, and there's no really good way to recover. Um, so this can help you avoid that those situations. But in order to achieve this, what we're looking at here, you have to plan every job. You have to have a plan for this, these jobs that are pending. You have to have a plan for the prospective uh, jobs uh, and your current jobs. And so you have to develop some form of discipline that if, if we're going to, to put this practice into place, we have to do our due diligence and planning on every project which may seem like a daunting task, but this tool is able to help you with that in, in some pretty powerful ways and, and make it a lot simpler than what you may be used to. Um, and when we say make a plan, that can mean different levels. But when you have a tool and when you standardize and create the process, like who is going to make the plan? Is it going to be estimators on pursuit jobs? Is it going to be a PM upon recognition of job award? you got to define the process pieces, I think, and specify, put it in front of people and say, this is exactly when all of our people are going to go through this motion using whatever tool it is. And if it's spreadsheets, it's, yeah, there's a reason why you don't see it coming together a lot of times or why it does feel daunting. They're not made to do that. And so when we have every single job having a plan, and let's talk a little bit about the plan. There's different layers, I would say, that you can go into having this plan that we've seen groups approach over the years. The first one is just Look, the job starts and ends, and we're going to need this many people for the whole duration. Fine. If it's just a headcount projection over the course of time from the estimate, so be it. Put it out there. But you got to put it somewhere where operations can start to staff against it and recognize when we're going over or under. Uh, we hear a lot, and understandably so. I get it. Uh, my history before the industry was I was an infantry officer in the Army, and Murphy's Law says, like, if it's going to hit the shan and it's always going to change, that's fine. We get it. It's always going to change. The plan's never going to stay the same. But when the field operations team and the project stakeholders can realign on what does the new plan look like or what was the impact of the new plan, we still have something to measure against. And, and that's critical. But in the moment when we're updating the plan, whether it's a headcount projection or whether we go to the next layer down, I would say, which is what types of individuals do we believe we're going to need for what durations? Still not even getting into staffing yet, right? just setting up the labor operations team to know here's what you can expect that I'm going to need for success on my job. 
But again, as long as we are updating the plan and having that team approach, project stakeholders updating the plan, field stakeholders or field leaders staffing and maneuvering people and aligning everybody on where they need to be next, we start to get this real time sort of team collaboration on who should be where and when guys, uh, uh, um, when guys are going to be coming on and off the job. And it keeps us all, it, it helps stabilize the whip. We'll get more into that. But if you have a tool, this view that we're looking at right now, this now, instead of being an ultimate endeavor, trying to consolidate the spreadsheets, update them, create the master spreadsheet, create the master forecast, right? This is now in real time. If this was, if this, if, if Gary and I were running a company and this was our actual master workforce capacity view, if I go out and win a job or my job slips to the right and I update that plan, Gary is going to see what's happening right here in real time so we can make more informed decisions on where we're chasing work and how aggressively we're chasing it. Uh, and I think that's something that everybody's obviously after today. And this is a real way to get there. Plan every job, have a tool that rolls it up in real time, and have the discipline in the process to make sure our people are constantly aligning and, and re-updating the plan, right? Updating what is the new target. We're going to move the goalpost, fine. You know, I hope our kicker can kick, kick an extra five yards. Um, I'm looking at the clock, we're going over to, to scheduling. And this this is a um, this is another one of those funny, we're just highlighting a couple of key areas of the book, right? So, but scheduling is one that's also like top of mind. Scheduling and dispatching is always just like, well, it's a it's a series of phone calls and we look for our people and such like that. Consider breaking down or defining scheduling to somebody. What does it really mean in construction and labor operations? And when you really think about it, it, it boils down to we are trying to balance our individual's availability across our projects or across our project needs. So uh, no doy, I get it. But one of the things that we're trying to, I think, stress or highlight here is we are very accustomed in this industry and most of our processes today, again, I think we're just sharing what we've seen from, from being inside the four walls. Most organizations today have vehicles or tools or spreadsheets, whatever it is, that track projects as they go left to right. I have project A starting, project B is going to closely follow, and then eventually I'm chasing project C and maybe we're going to win it. We consider projects going through and we, we schedule people to projects, but there's a, a major gap when we can't consider the individual's availability or the individual's path. So uh, think about it in your organizations today, when you look at the labor plan, when you go to see in your business, where are my people across my jobs? I almost guarantee you see job A and who's on job A. We don't see where is Gary going after this to job B and then eventually to job C. And there's a distinct reason. We don't usually have the tools. I mean, Gary, you... You guys went through from spreadsheet hell to building your own tools for workforce management. Yeah, maybe. but our our tools were very primitive. Um, they you weren't able to to take a look at a, a screen like this and be able to see. And I wish this illustration was a little bit different, where you could see multiple jobs. Where maybe the you know Aaron would go from job A to job B to job C. But I think you could visualize that. Um, the other thing is at any point in time here, you can drill down into what what the individual's uh, skill set is. You can drill down into um, the job titles, uh, looking for different types of people. Uh, this is a very comprehensive screen that would be very difficult to to uh, pull together with a spreadsheet. You you would. I don't think it, it'd be the next thing to impossible to bring all the information in that the platform can in, in one area to be able to really analyze uh, what the impact is of moving these people around and what time of people are available. So it, this is an example of a Gantt chart that everyone has. It's in everyone's spreadsheet. It's, it's in everyone's platform. But the ability to be able to uh, have this all in one place again in real time is is a very valuable tool to have in your toolbox and this also the book breaks us down further but one of the key things that that is needed for this to be valuable is the individual's availability but also who the individual is and how do we recognize their certifications their trainings etc a common 
occurrence, and I would consider this, when you think of your roster or who's in your organization today, uh, the information about our people, their certs, their trainings, are they good or bad at certain things? Do they have experience in underground work or controls work? A lot of times that lives somewhere else. It's fragmented off in another system, an HR software, uh, the safety spreadsheet, et cetera. If it's, think about it, if it's not in a consolidated place and if we are not actively maintaining those records, if we don't have explicit uh, uh, processes around when do we recognize a new employee and update their record with skills and experiences that are important to us, when do we go through and maintain or sync up our safety spreadsheet and update all of our trainings? If it's not going to be visible to our labor coordinators and our labor stakeholders, when we're looking for people, we're balancing just availability, which is, is great and all, and that's a daunting task in and of itself. But when we start to develop a workforce management practice, like what the book lays out, we can start to overlay on top, spread some icing over the cake, if you will, on, okay, I not only now can see in real time who's available at what different times over the course of weeks, months, or years, but I can also start to sort through my personnel and find the best fit or consider this, find who's not the best fit intentionally. Uh, we like to talk about upskilling and training the workforce, right? We're trying to find, we're always trying to find better people, right? I don't think any of our businesses are overflowing with great people. Uh, it's always a task trying to train and, and, and find more good people. Um, but consider this, if I don't have my skills and experiences consolidated on a baseball card or about my people, and I start looking for availability, I could have the opportunity to, to develop my people with every one of their assignments. I could actually look through here in a tool. If I have a tool fit to the task, I can say, who's available? Show me a group of people. I can see who's available when I need them next. But I also want to specify, do I have anybody that could use experience in a certain area? Uh, we hear a lot so-and-so is not good at controls work. We just haven't given them that opportunity yet. With a workforce management tool and with the right processes, I can maintain the information to where I could ultimately see on this job, I've got people that have controls experience, but I have an individual who could use that exposure. I'm going to pair them up intentionally. And so workforce management takes on this extra layer of complexity, but also it's feasible when you have a tool that pulls it all together and has it available in the moment when we're making those decisions and balancing our individuals across those projects. Keep riding on through here. And this is, I think, what we started to kind of hit on was this, we're talking about workforce management. Uh, we're talking about labor operations, balancing our people over. We're talking about how a lot of these things are usually living in other places. But if we get processes in place for doing things like the, the, the forecast that we highlighted earlier, uh, having a plan on every job by headcount, by specific type of personnel for different durations, maintaining that plan. Thus, we have the forecast. But the forecast ties into that roster, like we just said, when we're trying to pick who should go there, uh, we can find a whole new level of efficiency and, and upskill and maximize, maximize the people we do have by having a complete roster and having it available and in the same place. Um, the schedule aspect we hit on too, aligning my people across my projects and their availability, but those orange lines from the beginning, right? Scheduling goes right into communicating as well. And how do I keep everybody up to speed when all those orange lines and I switch people, I move people from job to job, a tool can help automate that. A tool can help ping all the viable stakeholders, not just the individual, but maybe the party that's losing the, the, the worker and the part that's gaining them and the information piece. Uh, where are we pulling this all together so the right people have the right amount of access or, or, or impact or, or uh, edit, 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 editing rights? And then productivity. Um, we're all doing some kind of actuals and productivity analysis, but if we don't have, if we don't have a plan, what are we really comparing it back to? And this bridge is how we try to convey, and that's what this book is ultimately explaining in great detail, uh, what exactly can we do to tie all of these different pieces together? Uh, Gary, what did I miss there? Well, I, you know, this, this really illustrates how all six of these are, are tied together. They're intermingled. They cannot survive on their own and, 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 uh, is an efficient workforce management system uh, if you do
do not tie them all together and get some type of processes that are, are interjoined. Um, you know, the, I like to point out here on this side, the R's, which are rivets that are holding each one of these processes together. Um, and so if we took out one of those, those rivets, things would get a little wobbly, right? Um, take out two or three, this whole thing would collapse. Now picture these, these columns, these pillars laying down on top of one another and the field operations collapsing in on top of it. They'd all still be there. They'd all still function on their own, but there's no interaction between them or very little interaction between them. And we can go back to the slide that shows the organized chaos, right? So we start firming up our, our systems and our processes by standing them up, supporting them, getting the discipline to, to repeat this on every project and start inserting these rivets back into place. I mean, I, th I think yesterday, kind of ironic, we, we saw what happens when, when you take out one of those pillars, what can happen to a bridge tragically. Um, and so that is what happens with, with your workforce management system. If you're not consistent across the board, you don't have the discipline to maintain it. Uh, and you don't have a vision like this to understand how they interact with one another. And I think one of the things, so one of our functions uh, inside of Rivet, our company, uh, is the implementation. And the implementation, we have a friend of ours too that uh, mentions, we have to put equal parts on the processes as much as the tool itself. So those little R's, I think those represent kind of the epitome of why this, this book or this pamphlet is, is what we're stressing today is that's the concept that's usually missing from the industry. A lot of people roll their eyes when they hear us talking about, oh, we're going to hear about forecasting again, or maybe even scheduling or something like that. Yeah, we all get it's hard, but the, the, the key to this, the secret sauce is how we tie them all together using the right people, have a team approach, how we tie them together with standard processes that we can lay out. Uh, first, identify all the processes, lay them out with who's doing what, when, what are the tools and are we going to commit to it? Are we going to commit to doing this in a consistent manner on every job, not just some? If you find yourself just labor planning the big jobs or you find yourself uh, just, you know, scheduling out the strategic job, what you're doing is you're building a puzzle, but you're leaving out half the pieces. It's all those small routine jobs in the middle that end up causing us the problems on how those big jobs do and don't, don't go well. Or we, we land the big job and then we have the five that, that cascade after it and take the hit. Um, so those rivets, that's the concept, I think, Gary, that uh, that we're trying to convey is tie it all together. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is just a real quick, what are we talking about? How do we kind of consider looking your own, some questions, some questions to ask yourself as we go through in your organization today. Um, the forecast again, do we have that job to identify at the different levels? Is it just a blank head count or do we break down what the crew ratio is gonna be before we hand it to our, our field stakeholders and they try to staff a job. Um, that's a big piece. Do we do this on every job, right? Um, do our labor plans actually match back up to what the estimate originally thought? And, and how do we resolve and get ahead or identify those potential threats? And the next one is the roster. Um, master list of my people. Uh, I'm trying to keep it updated with all kinds of different information. What makes my people unique? Is that information available? And can I leverage it when I'm looking for my people, trying to develop them intentionally through their assignments and through their experiences? Scheduling, are, are, are the projects and the schedules in one place? Am I actually able to plan? Am I just sending people to a job and saying, to be determined when I'll take you off? Are we trying to schedule people and decide this is the end date? Are we trying to ask ourselves then the question of, okay, now I know Gary's going to come available at this time and I'm going to subsequently plan him to go to the next job that we have coming down the pipe. So again, individuals pass across multiple jobs. And again, we ease into this as a journey. Communication. This is where it usually boils up and what, where we feel kind of the, the irritation about this whole, this whole uh, workforce management process. This is all the phone calls. This is all the text messages. This is the emails, the labor meetings, all the reports we're trying to pass back and forth. Uh, people showing up to one job saying, I never was told to go over here. Uh, that is the epitome of what 
a tool and these processes can eliminate. They really can because you have a source of truth now. If you didn't hear it from the workplace the platform, if you didn't hear it from the labor stakeholders, it's not official. We need to we need to reconsolidate and make sure everybody's tracking. And then productivity. Everyone is doing this uh, in some form or facet, right? Ultimately, we're taking our actuals and we all have our different methods for how we're trying to aggregate together. Are we on pace? Are we on track? Do we need to pick it up? Are we trying to slow down? What can we do as corrective measures? Uh, but consider, is that productivity analysis or the earned value analysis, is that getting brought back to the plan? Um, Gary, that was one of your guys' I know kind of key uh, mantras was earned value oh, analysis. I think that, you know, that that is really the, the secret sauce, right? If you, if you can actually tie your, your earned value analysis back to your labor plans and you have them aligned, your, your whip stabilizes, your, you know where you're going with your projects, you can develop uh, exit strategies that, that will prevent margin fade, um, that we all experience in that last 20% of the job. And so that is, now you have the ability to have some tools to be able to prevent that from happening, or at least mitigate it. One of the big things um, on that productivity piece and tying it back to the plan uh, we talked to a lot of organizations where we're doing the earned value analysis or a monthly kind of whip exercise. And we get to the piece where we think we've got, you know, uh, we have this much more hours or dollars or budget in the bag. Uh, we think we're ahead. We think we're behind. Consider, though, usually it's project stakeholders or financial. We're speaking of finance or project mindset or, or language at that moment. Yep, I think we're 5% ahead. But do we really ever give it back to the field stakeholders and the labor plan so they're tracking the same thing? Or in other words, if we think we're ahead, are we actually shaving off the assignments or the needs on that job and letting the field team know we are now planning on everybody coming off that job two days earlier? And that's what a tool can help us do. When we make those decisions, we're, we're having those conversations, looking at a workforce management platform, looking at a real-time picture that all of the team can be contributing to at the same time. When we make those decisions, those updates, and we tweak those jobs and the labor plans or the forecast to match, we know the field is now seeing the exact same thing in real time. And there's a way better chance, to Gary's point, that we, we come in at the expected target rather than kind of waiting to see what happens. Information. This, this is kind of the it, it, it's not, it doesn't get all the glory always, but information, the way we define it and the way we want you to kind of think of it at this moment is consolidation and, and, and visibility. And is it in real time and accessible to the right people? In other words, think about it. We're doing all this stuff today. We, we totally understand. What we're trying to say is try to bring it all together in one spot and have everybody looking at it at the right times. And, and we get this operational cadence that, that produces massive benefits. Uh, but the information piece is how do you pull it all together? If you're trying to do it with spreadsheets today, again, we understand it's it's a tool that's out there, uh, but there's a lot of pain that goes along with it. If you're trying to build your own tool, um, again, props to you. That usually becomes kind of a, a hole that we keep digging deeper because we need the next thing. We built it for scheduling. Now we need to forecast. Now we need my people information. Now we need to communicate it. It really never ends. So I say all that. Um, Gary, I guess kind of our closing thoughts here. Uh, I just want to, again, stress, we can't go into immense depth uh, in today's time. Obviously, it's brief, but we just want to convey there are these concepts uh, in workforce management or labor operations. And the key concept that we've picked up on from my perspective over time is if we tie them together and if we standardize the processes and we create a level of consistency that usually it takes a tool, a designated tool to visualize for us, and so we can see what's going on, um, we can really achieve some incredible, incredible benefits, especially for this, this current environment where we find ourselves with limited labor, mega projects are kind of this, this X factor in the mix. Um, Gary, kind of thoughts, closing thoughts? No, I think that's good. We have some time. I think we have some pretty good uh, questions that we could answer from the audience. Yeah, we'll open up the floor to some questions from the audience. Uh, just to remind you, you can use the Q&A module in the bottom right of your screen. I'm highlighting it for you again. Um, you can just type your question in, in there for Gary and Brian. Um, 
So we do have one question here so far. Uh, so for Gary specifically, when it came to that um, project at Westfall, what did it take and how long did it take to implement this practice at Westfall? And why did you care and what was the impact to the business? So we started this Westfall probably, I'm gonna say 17 years ago or more. Um, and what initiated it was we, we were a union contractor and our labor management system was structured where it was a, it was superintendent driven with very little or no input from the project managers when it came to labor management. Um, they were responsible for everything on their projects except labor and then the, the, um, the superintendents and the, and the GFs, they would take care of labor management. Well, we were experiencing margin fade quite routinely on our projects, and and we had a good we had a good company. You know, we had good estimators, we had good project managers, we had good people in the field. We had prefab departments. Um, our warehouse was running smoothly, but there wasn't anything that really tied it all together. And I set out on a mission to try to identify that and, and really come to the, the core issues of what this problem was. And so a project would, would end up and, and I'd go to the project manager and I'd ask, uh, what, what went wrong? Why did we lose all this money in the last 20%? And, and he'd shrug his shoulders, and, you know, go ask the superintendent. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with labor. Uh, go ask the superintendent and the superintendent would say, well, I think it was probably a bad estimate and we're lucky. You're lucky I got involved as much as I did because we probably would have lost another five, 10 percent. Go back to the office or back to my office and then the next day repeat that over and over. It's like Groundhog's Day. Well, something was fundamentally wrong. And so what I decided to do is restructure uh, the way that the company was structured for labor management and basically eliminated the general superintendent's position, uh, got him in a position where he was more supervisory than management, and then put the, the labor management onto the project managers and understanding that now I needed a platform. I needed something in real time that could, could uh, give them the tools so they'd be able to communicate between them because we no longer had the crutch of the, of the general superintendent. And, um, so we started out, there were no platforms to help us with that. So we started out with uh, Microsoft Outlook contacts, believe it or not, if, because it was a database and it worked pretty well. And then the, then about seven years ago, eight years ago, the, the uh, platform started to show up and we were able, able to utilize them now and that, that worked right into it. So it has been a very long, tedious drawn out process but it, it, it but primarily because the platforms weren't there at the beginning and we had to develop all the processes prior to implementing the platform um, and I still think that holds somewhat true today where you would have to develop the processes uh, the smart way is to develop the processes and then bring the platform in but the platform can certainly accelerate that and, and help you design and become the foundation for what your processes are. So I know that's a long drawn out answer. You hit on but uh, it's the most accurate one I can because it 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 does take some time. I think the situation at Westwell was a little bit uh, more um, out of the ordinary than what it is in today's world. Uh, and and why did why did I care and what it what was the impact on the business? Uh, I just wanted, I cared because I knew it was the right thing to do. And I knew over the long run that it was gonna help everybody and make everyone's life easier. Uh, as far as the impact on the, the business, it's, it's had a tremendous impact on the business. It's changed the culture, it's changed the efficiencies and the productivities, it's changed the profit margins. It's, it's, it's a quality place to work. Um, it had a tremendous impact on the success of the business. I want to hit on, um, you mentioned it was a long drawn out process. Uh, 
Westfall was attacking this as a business practice. Like what we're trying to convey, they already had that ideology going into it. Um, but it's a journey. So, so we implement companies through, through Rivet and my teams take them through a process focused start. Um, it is, it is key to recognize if you're going to endeavor into a workforce management initiative, you can start with a couple of those categories. I want to start with just getting some identification on scheduling. That's okay. We're not saying you have to go to hundred miles an hour right off the bat, but just recognize for it to be more and more sustainable and more and more valuable. There is this incredible opportunity to, um, not just don't stop at the first step there there's these subsequent steps and, and things that we can string together and then you get a, a holistic workforce management business practice which to gary's point when that comes together it's hard to put a value on it because it changes the way you execute jobs um but it does take time even with a platform it, it doesn't happen in weeks it happens over the course of months and then the cultural and operational changes i would say happen over the course of quarters if not a year um, so just know when you go in, you can get value, but it takes time to let the company as a whole begin to really move in the same direction. Yeah. All right. Um, and before I forget, we did get a question earlier about um, whether or not this webinar is being recorded. So just as a reminder, it is. Um, so you'll be getting an email afterwards with a link to the recording. And you're welcome to share that with anybody else who you think would benefit from this webinar. Um, Let's see, we have another question here. Um, would it be advisable to utilize admins to manage both forecasting and scheduling? I assume they mean software admins. Gary, I'll let you start this one. Okay. I don't know if there's really a clear cut answer to this one. Um, you know, the forecasting part is exactly that, and that's data in, and usually people aren't assigned to, to the project at the forecasting stage and uh, you get the information into the into the system. Uh, maybe a very good use of an admin's time, uh, depending on how your systems are integrated with other systems and, and, and whether or not it's gonna have data entry in, in, in maybe one platform that feeds into another. Maybe your ERP can feed that into a, a labor management platform. Um, so I would say from a forecasting standpoint that yes, uh, it would, uh, it, it would, I don't know if it'd be advisable, but it certainly is a, an opportunity. Um, as far as scheduling goes, that's a pretty active thing that, that happens on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, there's a lot of information that needs to be considered, I think, as the type of person, the wage rates, your composite wage rate, the person's skill sets, the availability and what you have planned in the future. And that may be something that uh, would fall more into the labor manager's uh, realm of responsibilities, but with this, with uh, the right coaching to the to the admin, yeah, I think it is a possible thing. And I think that Tom's question there about um, calling out forecasting and scheduling, if you have strong processes from what we've seen in the past, if you have really strong processes and you do have tools that enable them, it's way more feasible to have uh, an admin versus like a superintendent or, or a senior field director doing this stuff, right? Uh, because we have solid estimates coming through, we can create very accurate forecasts using that, maybe a tool to help us project what is the bell curve or the simple different kind of block forecasts look like. Um, but what we usually see and why it doesn't always work is if we don't have the processes there, we have schedulers that are really trying to balance um, the effects on the job. And so they'll have a labor coordinator or a senior field uh, leader living in Excel or living there trying to play phone tag because they have to use that gut intuition and experience while they're putting the person on the project. But again, if you break it into a workforce management business practice and have more of a team approach, I've got somebody that is feeding the plan or the forecast. I've got somebody now that is that is allocating and trying to fulfill those needs and send the right person. And they can find the right person, not because they know Bill, Bob, and George all have great experience in controls work, but rather it's in a tool. And they can just search for it and find it. And so I think it empowers 
our teams to be able to do these things without having all the years of experience. And, and that doesn't mean we're replacing those years of experience people, right? Instead, we get them back out. They can actually start going back out and improving and training and, and, and uplifting the entire the entire workforce. Uh, Gary, you called, what was it, SEAL team? Um, you had your team of productivity specialists. Well, I, I, every project had a team of six people that, that were responsible for different aspects of the job. So you had, you know, the labor managers, productivity specialists, pro project managers, um, uh, detailers, uh, warehouse personnel. Um, so the team approach, you know, it, it, and it took a team of six people or more on every project to execute it properly and, and spread the responsibilities across the board. And I think that Tom Which, followed up to his question. Sorry, Gary, Tom followed up with like a dedicated team approach. And I think that's Tom to answer your question more concisely. Maybe um, we do more typically see what Gary's talking about now. Of the team approach is the PMs and the field leaders. They are actively contributing rather than sending information to an admin and then an admin just updates the system uh, that ends up actually creating a, a time lag and a, and a delay. So things aren't in real time anymore, right? The superintendent or the field coordinator, or somebody said, Hey, I made a change and we're waiting for it to get updated in the system rather than that person just contributing in real time to the picture. So with that piece, I would not use admins if they're just waiting to be directed by the people making the decision, the people making the decision might as well be contributing to the picture in real time. Otherwise you're just, you've got a middleman for no reason. All right. Uh, we have another question here. Um, so a lot of people love their spreadsheets. I know I love my spreadsheets. So why should someone stop using spreadsheets? I guess going back to that, that uh, slide you had about Sisyphus. Well, I, I don't think you ever stop using spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Spreadsheets have their place. But when, when you start using a platform to uh, manage your labor the way it should be, Spreadsheets aren't in real time. You know, picture a, a, a typical contractor that manages their labor with spreadsheets. They have a labor meeting once a week or once a week, uh, typically on Friday. The uh, spreadsheet gets unveiled in front of the project managers and everyone else involved. And here's the plan. And it's usually owned by one person. And that person is probably a general superintendent or the labor manager. And they go over it, they modify it, they do what they think is right. And the minute everyone leaves that room, that spreadsheet now, that information on it is old and outdated because things are changing even during the course of that one hour meeting, something may have changed. So if other people aren't allowed access to that, they, they have a snapshot in time once a week versus being able to see it with the control transparency with permission levels set properly They'd be able to see that living, breathing workforce management system in real time, uh, which is, is invaluable because now you have multiple contributors. You have a level of collaboration that you've never seen before. People are all on the same page. It, it's remarkable the difference between a workforce management process managed by a spreadsheet and one that's a living, breathing, uh, up-to-date, live workforce management system. Well, it, Gary talks about, you know, real time. So let's say it's a, I, I, we hear this a lot, let's say it's a smart sheet. And let's say it's got other reporting Power BI and it's, it's all this nice little kind of like tape and it's, you know, very built out, right? Um, they are they're incredible tools in our business and my and our, my functions of the business like the first thing i do is go to a spreadsheet figure out how to see it and then i look for a tool built for the task right because the spreadsheet really is just like that initial crutch or that initial band-aid but as it gets more and more complex and as that function the business needs to keep growing um we just see spreadsheets just it's 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 nothing against them they just aren't built for this task and so it is a imagine we give to spreadsheets and they might run certain calcs that, by the way, at some point start to break too, as the spreadsheet gets more people with their hands in it, as the spreadsheet gets more stuff piled onto it, as we get more and more rows, as we get more and more projects, right? The spreadsheet starts to, it, it's we start to pile more and more stuff and put 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag kind of thing, if you get what I'm saying. And the spreadsheet starts to get, um, 
overwhelmed at some point. And we see a lot of groups that add on to it. They'll have Power BI, but it doesn't, it doesn't talk back to us. It doesn't have security measures always in place. And if it is, again, we're trying to take this, um, we're trying to take this crummy car and make it into a race car versus let's, let's buy something that has like it, the pieces together and then we train the driver, right? The spreadsheet also becomes a natural limiting factor on our people. Uh, we've worked with a lot of groups where their people are, they've got some of the best labor planning techniques. They know all of the different bell curve impacts uh, when to ramp up, when to ramp down. They do the site walks. They've got everything set up. But then the spreadsheet is now this this ball and chain that's dragging them back because it becomes people, process, technology. Those three things are symbiotic. One of them is going to be the limiting factor, and a spreadsheet will usually become your limiting factor the soonest. Think about it. All of our people have to come together to have the labor meeting to update the spreadsheet um, versus let them go off and do their thing and see it in real time. All excellent points. Uh, and we have time. Uh, oh, no, I apologize. It is three o'clock. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I guess that will be it for our questions. But if you have any more questions for our speakers today, you can contact them. The, their email should be in the module on the top right of your screen. Um, but, or you can also let, let Rivet know that you would like them to contact you using the survey at the end of the webinar. So with that, on behalf of Electrical Contractor and Rivet Work, I want to thank everyone for attending today. A big thank you to Brian and Gary for such a fantastic presentation. So like I mentioned, please don't forget to fill out the survey. It's going to pop up on your screen after the webinar ends. Um, and please be on the lookout in your email for the recording of these, this event, which will be available soon. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the day, and I hope we see you at a future webinar. Thank you, Colleen. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, everyone.